87 387 channels only and let's stand to sing can be useful in the service of God. Those two things go hand in hand. If you are not filled with the Spirit of God, you will be a very unuseful instrument. As we've just sung, God uses clean instruments. He doesn't use dirty instruments. He uses clean vessels, vessels that are fit for the Master's use. And tonight we're looking at three things, the laying on of hands, spirit filling and baptism of the Apostle Paul who at this time is Saul. We're in Acts chapter 9 looking tonight at verses 17 and 18 the Lord willing. Let's begin by opening in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father how we thank you for the privilege that we have of serving you. And Father as we look at our own lives we recognize that many times we are not very useful in your service because there is sin in our lives. We have failed to yield ourselves to your spirit. We have failed to cleanse ourselves and to make ourselves pure as we are commanded to do in scripture. And thus we are dirty instruments and of very little use. We pray, Father, that you will help us to understand what it means to be filled with your spirit we pray that you will help us to understand what it means to be useful in service, the service of our Master. Help us to understand how you have commissioned each one of us to be a clean vessel and to carry the gospel of Christ in that vessel to those who are lost. We pray, Father, for your blessings on your word tonight 
as it goes forth that it will not return void, but that it will accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week we looked at verses 15 and 16, the issue of suffering, and asked the question, have you ever suffered for Jesus? In verses 15 and 16, God speaking to Ananias says, But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. As Jesus was speaking with Ananias, for it is the Lord Jesus Christ that is speaking to him here, the first command is don't argue, just obey. Now we're going to see as we get to verses 17 and 18 that after Christ speaks to him this way in verses 15 and 16, Ananias immediately obeys. He wanted to argue first, the Lord Jesus Christ gave him a little bit of information, but he gave him a command. And for a believer who is in fellowship, what we do when we receive a command from the Lord is we must obey. We saw that God makes choices that we would not particularly make. Paul was a chosen vessel, and each of us are also chosen vessels. We discovered that unlikely candidates are often chosen for specific purposes, and sometimes those purposes include condemnation. Jesus answered, Have I not chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? Speaking of Judas. We saw that God's choices are always for a divine purpose, and the purpose that he has chosen us for is that we might bear fruit, as Jesus tells us in John chapter 15. We saw that we've been chosen to witness We've been chosen to know the will of God. We've been chosen to salvation in eternity past. All of us have been chosen to do battle. And we looked at many verses that covered these various things. We saw that when we are chosen, we are given a name. A special name that is designed for us. We are called Christians. A name based on our chief occupation. We've discovered that God's choice of vessels and his choice of assignments is so that he can teach us something through it, for I will show him. And we noted also that God chooses some and appoints some to great suffering, but he appoints all of us to some suffering if we're walking by faith and obeying him. Yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. The purpose of suffering is suffering for the name of Christ, not merely for our own stupidity or our obnoxious behavior. We are to suffer for him. And when one member suffers, all the members of the body suffer with it. We are interconnected spiritually. And we all have a place in that suffering as other believers, wherever they are in the world, are also suffering for Christ. And then we noted Peter points out that we must, if we're going to suffer, suffer as Christians. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults ye take it patiently? But if when ye do well and suffer for it ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. But and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. For it is better, if the will of God be so, and that was clearly the case with Saul, who became Paul, if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Now, folks, that speaks to us today. I don't know how many murderers we have here, how many thieves, and how many evildoers we have, but we, all of us, at some time or another, are involved as busybodies in other men's matters. If you suffer for that, it's no big deal. You're suffering for your own faults. But, he goes on, he says, But if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God 
on this behalf. And he tells us how to handle it. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing. That's how we're supposed to act when we suffer. Instead of being bitter and resentful, instead of clamming up and refusing to testify for Christ, instead of getting even, as I once knew a man who said, I don't get mad, I just get even. <laughs> no, we are supposed to commit the keeping of our souls in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. And then we finally find the promise in Revelation that as we go through the suffering for Christ, and if we are faithful unto death, it says, I will give thee a crown of life. And so that brings us to verse 17, which is where we are tonight. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, so we have no question as to who it was that made these appearances, hath sent me. It was Jesus that spoke to Ananias, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. It's interesting, after Ananias had received his commission from the Lord Jesus Christ and understood God's purposes for Saul, look how he addressed Saul. He didn't say, well there, Saul, you rascal, you persecutor of Christians, you baddo. <laughs> he said, brother Saul. How different his attitude was from his initial shocked response of, Lord, I have heard from many how bad this man is. When he arrives there, a man whom he probably had great loathing for in his heart, and great fear of because of what Saul had done, he addresses him as Brother Saul. When you and I were saved, it suddenly put us into a new family. Suddenly we have new brothers, and suddenly we have new sisters. Suddenly those who were not part of our physical family in this world became very close members of our spiritual family. They became not two or three generations removed or two or three different degrees on the Nolan chart removed. They became our brothers and our sisters, not our uncles, not our aunts, not our cousins, not our second cousins, not our nephews, not our nieces. They became our brothers and sisters, regardless of what their past was, regardless of whatever evil things they had done before. At the moment of salvation, they became our brothers and our sisters. Let's remember that, folks. When we come across Christians that perhaps are not exactly the same as we are. When we think about Christians in other parts of the world where they don't have the same third world or first world living conditions that we have because they are a third world country. They are co-equals with us in the same family they are brothers and sisters and joint heirs with Christ. It's a magnificent picture. And here we see Ananias learns it. Ananias understands it. Ananias, after his initial objection, obeys and immediately understands he has a new relationship with Paul or with Saul. And so here he gives the little speech to Saul who is sitting there in the dark. He says, he sent me to you that you might receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes, as it had been, scales, and he received his sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. Now, some of you all here, and others who are not able to be with us tonight, but here in this congregation, in fact, quite a few, have recently had cataract surgery. You've had something taken off your eye by a laser. You've had a new lens implanted in there. You've had it stitched up. And suddenly, you can see like a teenager once again. There's a great deal more light. There's a great deal more clarity. There's a great deal more color. And it's exciting. And it's, wow, it happened in 15 to 20 minutes. 
Here's something that happened even faster than that. It was immediate. As Ananias has his hands on Saul, and as he says those words, the scales immediately fell out of his eyes, and he could see clearly. That's tremendous. That's what God does. When God brought us from darkness to light, he gave us new sight. He gave us new ability to perceive what was going on around us, which is what light does. It helps you to understand what is happening around you. Because he's going to give us a command, as we'll see later on, that we're to walk circumspectly, redeeming the time. Circumspectly means you are looking around. Circum, that's the part about around, and spectly, from spectare, it means to see, to look around you as you walk through life. The blind man cannot do that, but the Christian who has new sight can do that. Now the first thing that we notice as we look at our two verses for tonight is where did all of this take place? It took place in what we have referred to as the safe house where Saul was. The people who were with him took him by the hand, brought him into Damascus, and put him in a place that they knew about. We don't know where they are at this time. They might have also been staying there. They might have been out at the time that Ananias came home. They might have decided to go back to Jerusalem for further instructions. We don't know what happened to the other traveling companions of Saul. But he's in a place where he can trust the man who is in charge of the house to take care of him. Perhaps someone who is in the pay of the high priest. We don't know. But all of this is taking place there in that house where Paul was staying. And notice a few verses earlier, I mean, we know that this is the house because it says, The Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth, and has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. So Saul is still at the place that he was left and Ananias is told to go to that house. Because Saul has seen a vision of Ananias coming to that place. Saul, because he has that vision, is not going to move from that house until Ananias shows up. Verse 17 also says it was in the house. Ananias went his way and entered into the house. That's the house that we've just been speaking of. Now as we look at that, that actually gives us the very first clue as to the mode of of baptism by which Saul was baptized. There's no indication anywhere in the text that they left the house. There is no indication that they went to a pool or to a river or to a public bath in the city. There is no indication that the house of Judas, who was most likely on the payroll of the high priest in Jerusalem, had a baptistry in his house. The second clue as to the mode of baptism in these two verses are the final three clauses in verse 18. And he received his sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. The Greek structure of the text here, and it's obviously clear in the English too, but it indicates that things immediately happened in immediate succession without any lapse of time in between. We see an example of the use of the word forthwith in Acts 3, 7 and 5, 10. It's a special word. It's the word parakrema. And it is used in two other instances where we can clearly see that it's a word that deals with immediate situations where there is no time lapse in between. Acts chapter 3, the first example. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, give I thee. 
In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. Now here's our word. Parakrema. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping, stood up and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. Now how long did that healing take? It didn't take a long time. As Peter lifted him up, it occurred. The sweeping movement of Peter's hand pulling this man upright. It was at that very moment that he received strength in his feet and ankle bones. He's immediately standing. He's immediately walking. He's immediately leaping. Let me give you another illustration of how parakrema is used. Acts chapter 5. But a certain man named Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whiles it remained, was it not thine own? <laughs> and after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. The problem was not that he kept back part of it. The problem was he lied about it. He said, I'm giving the whole thing to God. I want to get as much credit as Barnabas just did at the end of chapter 4 when he sold a piece of land in Cyprus and gave it, and he gave the whole thing. And man, he got a lot of praise for that. And Ananias and Sapphira said, man, We've got this piece of property, we can sell it. And you know, we can keep a little nest egg for ourselves, but we can pretend that we've given the whole thing. The problem is not that they didn't give the whole thing. The problem was they pretended to give the whole thing. And Peter said, you're lying, not merely to man, you are lying to God. Because God knows what you did, and he just told me. And so Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came on all them that heard these things. And the young men arose. The church worship service is still going on. Can you imagine that? Somebody drops dead. We have some people here in the church who, when this happens, they pick up the dead body, wrap it up, go out, dig a hole, put it in the ground, and come back to church. And the church service is still going on. <laughs> things were a little different back then. Now listen to verses 7 and 8. It was about the space of three hours after long service, when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. And Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether ye sold the land for so much. And she said, Yea, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out. Now here's our word. Then she fell down straightway. Parakrema. Then she fell down straightway at his feet, yielded up the ghost, and the young men came in, found her dead, and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. How long did it take for that process to occur for her falling down and dying at Peter's feet? Was there a long interval in between the falling down and the dying? No, because the young men's feet were at the door. They're walking in. They see her fall down. She's dead by the time they get to the front of the church. They pick her up. They wrap her up. They take her out. They bury her. That's our word straight away, parakreia. That's the word that we find here in Acts chapter 9. She did not go through a long, drawn-out, operatic stage death where she sang a full-throated mezzo-soprano aria while the palace guard and the couriers waited in astonished silence. She dropped to Peter's feet and died as the pallbearers were walking in from the first burial. Now, we discover another word here in our text, very interesting. This word, perakreia, is combined with the word immediately, and immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales. The word immediately is a different word. It's the word eutheos. The text here, by putting these two words together, is emphasizing the quickness of the events without any intervening intervals 
of time. Immediately, Euthaos, there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received his sight forthwith, parakrema, and arose and was baptized. Now, as you study the life of Saul, who becomes the Apostle Paul, I think it's quite evident that he was a man of action. When he knew what to do, he did not dally around. He did it immediately. Saul had obviously been meditating on what should be his next step. He'd been fasting and praying for three days. He's a man who knew a lot about Christians. He had studied them carefully so that he could be most efficient as a killing machine. He knew that after they got saved, the first thing they wanted to do was to openly identify as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. They wanted to be baptized. He had probably witnessed the mass baptism in Jerusalem on the first day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, and we studied that in depth earlier in this series. He is now convinced that Jesus was the Messiah. He's been meditating on all those Old Testament scriptures which he had memorized as a lad. Saul had just been saved, and what did he want to do? He wanted to be baptized immediately. Where was he? He was in the house. We don't know who else was there, if anybody, besides Ananias, but that's where Saul was baptized. He was baptized in the house. If we're talking about mode, it seems to be fairly self-evident that he was not baptized by immersion. The baptismal modes with which he would have been familiar and which probably occurred in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost were the modes of sprinkling and or pouring. That would fit the Old Testament picture of the way the Messiah would baptize and would give an appropriate picture of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Speaking of the prophesied Messiah, Isaiah writes, Isaiah 52, verses 13 through 15, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. As many as were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. We know we're talking about Christ. No one questions that these verses are talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, except Jews who don't want to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. These are clearly talking about Christ. His form more than the sons of men. Then verse 15, immediately. So shall he sprinkle many nations. And kings shall shut their mouth at him, for that which had not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. We have here a prophetic utterance that is reaching out beyond the Jews to many nations. Saul is the apostle to the Gentiles. It is through the Apostle Paul that the gospel is going to go out to many nations. He it is that writes most of the New Testament epistles all to Gentiles. Speaking of the Holy Spirit on the prophesied day of Pentecost, and it's also quoted by Peter in Acts 2, Joel writes this prophecy. We've seen sprinkling in Isaiah 52. Now listen to what Joel writes, speaking of the Holy Spirit, of whom baptism is a symbol. Beginning in verse 28. And it shall come to pass that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days, here it is again, will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in heaven and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered, for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. 
Now we know from Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2, and we've been over it in detail, so we'll not do that again, but just a quick reminder that Peter jumps from that pouring out of the Holy Spirit at the end of his sermon to that last verse, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Peter reads the entire passage or quotes the entire passage to them from Joel 2, but he omits expounding those internal verses which relate to the day of the Lord, the second coming of Christ, the tribulation period immediately preceding the entrance into the millennial kingdom. So he moves from the pouring out of the Spirit to whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Very important to remember that. But the picture that is given is that of pouring, the pouring out of the Spirit. And baptism, water baptism, speaks of the work of the Holy Spirit. So to fulfill the typological picture, Paul or Saul was almost certainly baptized with either sprinkling or pouring. That position is further strengthened when we look at the phrase, and arose and was baptized. Literally translated, if you take the Greek tense into effect, literally it says, and standing was baptized. And standing was baptized. Now folks, you're not immersed while you're standing. But you can either be baptized by sprinkling or pouring while you are standing. Now of course we recognize that some of our very dear brothers in Christ insist that all water baptism in the New Testament was by immersion. And hence, they try to rule out any occurrences of infant baptism. We've already discussed that subject at some length when we devoted extensive time to the six different topics related to baptism back in Acts chapter 2. So let me merely note by way of passing, there is one other possibility of what occurred here. The only other option is this, that the baptism of Saul here in Acts 9 is not a water baptism at all, but rather it is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, listen carefully. If that's the case, if that is the case that what we have in Acts 9 is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is occurring periodically throughout the book of Acts, if that's what this is a record of, then there is no record of Saul or Paul ever having received water baptism. If you opt for spirit baptism in this text, it means you have no record of Saul or Paul, the apostle for the Gentiles, ever being water baptized. So there in a nutshell you have it. Either Paul received a non-immersion baptism, or he received no baptism at all that was ever recorded in the New Testament. That would clearly make water baptism in the eyes of the Apostle to the Gentiles a non-significant event if one of those two things were the case. That it was such is clearly evident from the distinct commission that Paul received in contrast to the rest of the Apostles. Notice what the Apostles received as what we call the Great Commission. Matthew 28 verses 19 and 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Now, we've already pointed out and noticed that there are no baptisms in Acts or any time following that co command that use that particular formula. The issue is not the formula. The issue was the commission. Because we don't see ever any place in the New Testament someone being baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And then verse 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Now that was the command, the commission that was given to the eleven, and later to them was added Matthias, as you know, in Acts chapter 1. But listen to the commission that Saul, Paul, received. 1 Corinthians 1.14, it's different, it's distinct from the commission given to the eleven. I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name. And I baptized also the household 
of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. For Christ, now here it is, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Years ago, I saw a pamphlet written by a very famous preacher in Indiana, which the title of the pamphlet was, Let's Baptize More Converts. I mean, that was his goal. The more baptisms you could get, the better off you were. You just get them and dunk them under, and boy, you've, you've got it made. And you can count scalps that way and hang them up on the outside of the church, you know, all the way around with, we baptize more converts than anybody else in the United States. That wasn't Paul's commission. Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. We learn four things about Paul's commission from this passage. Number one, baptism is not part of the gospel. Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Number two, baptism was not part of Paul's commission. Christ sent me not to baptize. It was part of the commission given to the others. The third thing we learn is Paul did, in fact, baptize many people, even if it was not part of his commission. He only lists three different people or groups in this passage. He lists the chief Jew, he lists the chief Gentile at Corinth, and he mentions a household. But many are mentioned as having been baptized at Corinth in Acts chapter 18. Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, remember Paul mentions him here in 1 Corinthians 1.14. I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus. He's the first one mentioned. So Crispus hears the gospel and gets saved and gets baptized. Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Paul only lists two names, and he lists a household. But Acts 18, we discover that many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Now you can argue, well, perhaps somebody else baptized them, but Paul was the one who was there leading them to Christ. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. That leads us to conclusion number four that we can learn from this passage, that Paul did not keep baptismal records. Now, I know we have gotten into the habit as Western Christians of making sure we have baptismal records. And that was started by the Church of Rome long ago because that's the way in which they counted scalps in terms of they baptized the babies and that was supposed to be some way in which those babies got saved and then they would later have to take communion and then they would later have to obey all the Roman Catholic rules or they would get excommunicated and all of this. That's where it got started with the records keeping and then now we keep those records to prove certain things when you go for citizenship and I mean all kinds of ways in which baptismal records are used now or even transferring to different churches. But Paul, a year and a half at Corinth, baptized many people and by the time he writes 1 Corinthians, he can't even remember who they were. Dear people, yes, I believe it is important to be baptized. I believe it is important for the individual to openly identify with Christ or parents to openly identify their infants with the body of Christ and take the responsibility that they will raise this child in the fear of the Lord. But it is not for salvation. It is not for sanctification. It does nothing magical or mystical. It identifies the individual or the child being baptized with a promised work of the Holy Spirit of God. We've talked about that at length. In any case, some of the brethren who wish to keep the doctrine of immersion intact will choose that particular option that the baptism spoken of here is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
and will actually choose to leave Paul as an unbaptized Jewish convert. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not, as we've said before, speaking in tongues. It is the work by which the Holy Spirit joins us to and identifies us invisibly, the baptism of the Spirit, invisibly with the body of Christ. Paul writes that in 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 and 13, again to the same group of believers where he baptized many of them but could not remember who they were. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. Paul defines for us there what the baptism of the spirit is. It's not speaking in tongues, and we've proved that by many different means as we've discussed that particular spiritual gift, which was a temporary gift only during the days of the apostles. But he defines it for us, the baptism of the Spirit, he defines it for us as that point at which you are unified with, identified with, joined to the body of Christ, which takes place, of course, at the moment of salvation. That moves us to the second significant topic in these verses, the filling of the Spirit. The filling of the Spirit is not the same thing as the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Remember, Ananias told Paul, he said, I'm here so that you can receive your sight and be filled with the Spirit. So that's the second topic that we have here in our text. The baptism of the Spirit joins the believer to the body of Christ. It occurs once and only once. It occurs at the moment of salvation. It cannot be lost and it cannot be repeated. The baptism of the Spirit is never commanded. It is automatic at the moment you trust in Christ and were saved. It is invisible and is only evident when other works of the Holy Spirit are manifest in your life through, and here is the distinct doctrine, through the filling of the Spirit. The baptism of the Spirit joins you to Christ. The filling of the Spirit works through you in a way that shows that you are belonging to Christ. The filling of the Spirit occurs on a regular basis. The filling of the Spirit occurs on a periodic basis. The filling of the Spirit can be repeated over and over. The filling of the Spirit is commanded to the believer. The filling of the Spirit is not automatic like the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But the filling of the Spirit requires certain prerequisites. It also has certain visible, external results. The filling of the Spirit is the evidence of a life that is controlled by the Holy Spirit. That is the key word to remember when you're talking about the filling of the Spirit. The issue of filling is the issue of control. Listen to how Paul describes it and all the things that surround it in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 21. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess. But, now he's setting this in contrast to all of those commands that he has just given, but... Be filled with the Spirit. And now he shows you the results. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Interesting. The first external visible results that are listed for the filling of the Spirit all relate to music. Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs making melody in your hearts to the Lord. 
We've talked about the importance of music, so I'll not belabor that tonight. Verse 20, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. There are nine things, at least nine things, that are listed for us here in this passage that relate to the filling of the Spirit. The filling of the Spirit, make sure you understand this, is distinct from the baptism of the Spirit. The baptism of the Spirit joins you to and identifies you with the body of Christ, though it is invisible. The filling of the Spirit is on a regular, periodic basis and gives the external manifestation that you are, in fact, part of the body of Christ. What are those nine things that are listed for us here in the text tonight? Number one, the circumspect Christian walk. We talked about that a moment ago. You remember the scales fell off of Paul's eyes. He was able to see. Circumspect means to look around you as you walk. The circumspect Christian walk will be the first evidence of a spirit-filled life. Just like Paul received his sight and immediately began to serve, he was able to look around. The circumspect Christian life, number two, the walk of wisdom, not the walk of folly. Suddenly our entire perspective on life, our entire world view changes. Before it was all, what can I do for myself? What are the fun things that I can get involved in? Why should I think about anything eternal? That's the walk of folly. But now he tells us to walk in wisdom, not as fools, but as wise. The book of Proverbs tells you what the fool is like. There are many different kinds of fools in the book of Proverbs. We won't cover them now, but there are many different kinds of fools. Some people fall into one category more heavily than into another. But all of the world falls into at least one of those categories of fools in the book of Proverbs. Now, once you're saved, once the Spirit of God begins to work in your heart, it begins to change how you view and how you act in the world around you. The walk of wisdom, not folly. The third thing that is a clear evidence of the work of the Holy Spirit is the refusal to waste time. But use your time wisely. When you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you recognize the value of time. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. You suddenly begin to realize what is important. It's not how many toys you can amass here in this world. It's what can you send on ahead. You know, years ago I saw a bumper sticker. It still sticks with me. It says, he who dies with the most toys wins. No, he who dies with the most toys loses. He comes in last place. Those who invest this life and everything that they own in it in eternity are the ones who win. The filling of the Holy Spirit begins to make that manifest in the way in which we use our time and our resources in this world. As we're going through this, I hope that you're examining your own heart as I have to examine mine to say, am I filled with the Spirit? Or am I only play-gaming Christian? Because when we are filled with the Spirit, these are the things that will manifest externally. Baptism of the Spirit is invisible. Nobody can see that happen. Well, they can see you walk to the front. They can see you weep at the sinner's bench. They can, you know, see you raise your hand and make a profession. But they won't know that it's really happened until you are filled with the Spirit. And you are commanded to be filled with the Spirit. The fourth thing is the recognition of the increasing and impending evil world around us. Because the days 
are evil. Suddenly you're walking and you're looking around and you're beginning to realize what kind of danger there is, what kind of evil there is, what you never considered evil before. Now suddenly you have a sensitivity to, by the Spirit of God, that this is evil. This is not something in which I, as a Christian, should be involved. The fifth thing is the understanding of the perfect will of God. Now we've studied that in detail, but notice he mentions it here. Be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. The spirit-filled Christian is not a balloon airhead Christian. The spirit-filled Christian is not a Christian who tiptoes through the tulips like Tiny Tim. The spirit-filled Christian is one who earnestly desires to know and obey the will of God. What was the question that Saul asked of the Lord Jesus when he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. What was the next, Christian, uh, the next question that Saul asked? Lord, what will thou have me to do? The very first thing that he wanted to know was the will of God. If you are filled with the Spirit of God, that should be constantly at the forefront of your mind. What is the will of God for my life? The sixth thing is the abstention from alcoholic beverage. And Paul uses that to set a contrast with being filled with the Spirit be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, when we began this discussion of the filling of the Spirit, you recall that I said the issue is control. Allowing the Spirit of God to control your life. Because the more control that he has, the more it affects everything about your externals. When you are filled with wine, and you've heard me give this illustration before, but it is appropriate again. When you are filled with wine, it controls the way you think. When you are filled with wine, it controls your speech, which becomes slurred and unintelligible. When you are filled with wine, it controls your body movements and the things that you do which you don't remember the next day. When you are filled with the Spirit, in contrast, He controls your mind, what you think about. He controls your speech, what you say. He controls your body, the things that you do, the places that you go, and gives you an articulate remembrance of it when it is done for the glory of Christ. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And then we find those results that we mentioned a moment ago. It will result in a life filled with godly music. It will result in a life filled with thanksgiving in the name of Christ. It will be a life of obedient submission to authority. That's the Spirit-filled life. And as Ananias is speaking to Saul, he is telling him not merely that he will be saved, but he will be filled with the Spirit. And as you look at the New Testament, can you find any other greater example other than our Lord Jesus Christ, who was continually filled with the Spirit? Can you find any greater example than Saul, who becomes the Apostle Paul? Here was a man who obeyed the command, which he then passed on to us, but be filled with the Spirit. The filling of the Holy Spirit is directly connected to the cognizant, willing, yielding of the believer's body to the work of the Spirit in his life. This is a matter of making daily, habitual choices each one of us as believers will make these daily choices as we face multiple temptations throughout the day. 
Paul spends nearly an entire chapter dealing with that issue in Romans chapter 6. Here he describes to you the mechanics of being filled with the Spirit. Beginning in Romans chapter 6, verse 11, the Apostle Paul writes, Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Very important word here. We won't spend too much time on it, but the second word in that verse, reckon. Reckon ye also yourselves. That's a bookkeeping term. Count it up, chalk it up as a divine fact that your new position in Christ places you in a different category, in a different column of the ledger. And so he says, because of that, now what are the practical results? Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Now remember, the filling of the Spirit deals with the control of the Spirit in all the external manifestations of our lives, our thought life, our speech life, our life of action. Neither yield ye your members, that is the members of your mortal body, as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members, that's the parts of your body, as instruments of righteousness unto God. You are making choices. You, by the power of the Spirit, are enabled to make these choices as to whom you will yield your body. You have pulls different direction. You have a pull to yield your members as instruments of sin unto unrighteousness. You have a pull to yield your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. You are the one who chooses to whom will you yield. That's why we are commanded, and it is not automatic, why we are commanded to be filled with the Spirit. Because it's at that point of when you yield one way or the other, you're either going to be filled with the flesh, with carnal thoughts, with carnal speech, with carnal actions, or you yield the other direction and your life is filled with holy thoughts, with holy speech, and with holy actions. We make that yielding. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. There are people who argue, well, what keeps me in line is I obey the Ten Commandments. I keep the law of God. No, you don't. You can't. Because your thought life is not under control. When you lust, you commit adultery. When you hate, you commit murder. When you covet, you commit theft. In fact, you not only commit theft, you commit idolatry. For covetousness is idolatry, and the covetous man is an idolater. Ephesians 5.5, 5, Colossians 3.5. You cannot keep the law. You're not under the law, you're under grace. And under grace, God gives you his Holy Spirit, by which you can make the choices here in Romans chapter 6. You can't do it in the flesh. You will always fail. And so Paul goes on. But God be thanked. Oh, excuse me, verse 16. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. You haven't lost it yet. Neither have I. None of us get to be sinlessly perfect in this life. John makes that clear in 1 John chapter. 1 verses 9 through 10, 8 through 10. We all know verse 9, but 8 through 10, he makes it clear that if you say you don't have a sin nature, you've deceived yourself. If you say you've not sinned, you're a liar and the truth doesn't abide in you. That's verses 8 and 10. 
I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh, for as ye have yielded your members, servants, to uncleanness and to iniquity, unto iniquity, even so now yield your members, servants, to righteousness, unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end, everlasting life. We know verse 23. We always take it out of its context. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Being filled with the Spirit has a specific mechanism that is given to us by the Apostle Paul in Romans 6. That is, day by day you're faced with choices as to whom you will yield to. Will you yield to unrighteousness and to sin? Or will you yield to the Spirit of God and be filled with the Spirit, resulting in the nine things that we saw in Ephesians chapter 5? One other point that I must make, and I see we're running out of time, that yielding in Romans 6 is different from the once and for all, one time, singular presentation of our bodies to Christ for his service. Paul speaks of that in Romans chapter 12. Romans 6 deals with the day-by-day -day practice of yielding so that we might be filled. Romans chapter 12 speaks of a time, and it should occur in the life of every believer, whereby we present our bodies to him as a living sacrifice. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present, that's an aorist tense, it's a once and for all, time past action that has continuing uh, events that happen as a result of that in the future. That ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's where you start. And then on a daily basis, you yield yourself to the Spirit of God, that you might bear fruit unto righteousness, fruit unto holiness, that you might be filled with the Spirit of God so that regardless of what circumstances are around you, and you are circumspectly looking at that as you walk through life, regardless of circumstances, your life is filled with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, with joy and rejoicing, because you know that God is in control. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your gracious gift of your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the text that we've been able to partially look at tonight. We pray that you will cause us to remember its truth, its power, and the fact that you have given to those who are members of the body of Christ, who have been baptized into Christ, that you have given to them your indwelling Holy Spirit, who will never leave them, who will always be with them, who will abide with them forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. And Father, as we walk through life, cause us to yield day by day, not to the temptations of the flesh, or of the world, or of the devil, but the flesh is the door through which they come. Help us, Father, rather to yield to the Spirit of God, that we might bear fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, fruit unto righteousness and holiness and to the glory of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. For we pray it in his name. Amen.